Hello, I'm Tina, and I'm here to talk about uh, protocol upgradability. And throughout this presentation, I kind of just want to distill what it actually is, what the alternatives are, the trade-offs, and what possible solutions are to getting to permissionless upgradability, and what I think we're doing right now, and how eigenlayer slashing mechanism and protocol upgradability is one of those solutions that is contributing to the innovation and development of this. Okay, so we all know that protocols should be permissionless. We know this, we uh, have discussed and um, had trials and tribulations about how to verify that it's decentralized from consensus to execution. We know how to def uh, define and identify points of centralization. And this has already been something that's been a point of contention for um, since proof of work and uh, proof of stake and a lot of the Bitcoin research that a lot of the members that are here uh, present today. So with the goal of decentralization, some of the trade-offs when people are trying to do blockchain development oftentimes uh, results in aspects of centralization to achieve safe intervention of protocol uh, readability. So, I kind of listed out um, different examples, but I wanted to highlight that this is a problem that's um, present within every part of the transaction state. So an example would be in sequencing. So a blockchain A, which I would categorize as a rollup in this case, is relying on a single sequencer for their execution. Yes, they may be um, executing transactions in a way uh, that seems permissionless, but they are inherently centralized in the aspect that they are kind of like a co-processor processing these transactions under a single sequencer rather than alternatives that may be like a shared sequencer or distributed sequencing models. So this is kind of an example of how it even goes down to the sequencing level. The second would be a validator example. So blockchain B uh, relying on a small cluster of validators um, that are owned by a single validator firm um, to validate these uh, network changes. So I think we've seen a lot of cool innovation that's being done um, with distributed validator sets um, and OBOL um, and a number of the validator uh, firms that are pursuing innovation. But a huge problem is that a lot of these validator firms are under acting under the guise of one validator when they're operating a large cluster of validators. And this is another point of centralization. And then the last one would be a consensus algorithm. So this would be the example of the leader-based algorithm um, that is used for consensus. Um, and it oftentimes results in uh, DDoS attacks. Um, and this is because it's a leader-based lottery system um, that uh, can oftentimes be uh, centralized to that leader um, being followed. Okay, so now that we know this is kind of a discussion and um, there are trade-offs when you're trying to pursue permissionless um, upgradability and then also maintain decentralization, one thing I wanted to display is like, we displayed the different examples from the full transaction state and the state to finality, but what about the real um, applications to the user? So an example would be um, this protocol not being permissionless. Um, I'll use an example of a protocol I used to work with, which is like Element Finance. So if they're not going into a DeFi position and it's requiring a signature every single time they want to roll into a new position, that is not inherently um, permissionless because it's requesting their authorization rather than using pre-existing authorization to enter this new position each time. And then wallet uh, would be a user um, a requesting a blockchain uh, to intervene in a hack. So we see this quite, actually quite a lot for Eigenlayer when uh, users request um, that their, ha their wallet has been compromised, and they want the uh, internal Eigenlabs team to interfere and uh, pause the contracts with the pausing mod sig 
and um, retrieve their funds. And pursuing this act would be a point of intervention, um, but it would also be um, 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 not maintaining the integrity of decentralization. Okay, so why the need for oversight? So I love cat memes, and I love this one, but this is me being the sad, the sad decentralization pro that's realizing that the reason we're having these discussions is because of the bad actors. <laughs> so I made this meme that kind of um, showcases that the main people that oftentimes are needing intervention in these cases of making trade-offs for centralization, the causes of this are that bad actors, either validators in the transaction state or um, in the wallet level, um, bad actors affecting other users on the network, um, on blockchains or applications. Okay, so who wins? <laughs> Uh, so I do not think that anyone wins in this case scenario, but I think that one of the cool ways that you could pursue solutions for this is coming up with dynamic parameters and mechanisms to um, set more guardrails and dynamic risk parameters that are catered to protocol development and protecting users. And that's kind of what I'm gonna discuss. Okay, so to start off, I wanted to define upgradability because I don't think anyone actually knows what it means. So I see it used a lot, both on Twitter and contexts of um, research and a number of other talks. But I think that when people um, address immutability and uh, governance upgradability, oftentimes they don't understand what the two difference is. Uh, so immutability is the concept that you don't want these contracts to be um, revised in any way. You don't want third party um, or revision to the contracts that are deployed. And this is a concept to, um, to protect reversal and any changes. But uh, upgradable contracts and governance upgradability was a concept that was coined um, to make consistent upgrades to these existing contracts. And I'm gonna go into the trade-offs now of what the security risks there are. So, my favorite case is a wormhole case. So, um, this was a case um, that kind of displayed uh, the point of centralization intervention, and it was with the Oasis hack. Um, and Oasis had their high council kind of make a, um, intervening counter exploit and this act of centralization of making a counter exploit was not only a risking integrity to their decentralization as a whole but it was showing that there was a backdoor um, to their smart contract development and protocol permissionless okay so this is the actual etherscan transaction of their counter exploit but i think one thing that was interesting to me and a uh, point to make in this governance upgradability talk is that oftentimes when people are pursuing upgradability to smart contracts there's still a core group of people that are pushing these changes and oversee a majority of these changes so it could be a multi-sig um, it could be core developers but the autonomy of who's deploying these changes has not changed. And whether it's a two to three multi-sig, it's a number of people that are overseeing a committee, um, the actual uh, consensus and deployment of these upgradable contracts, that's the main point of contention that needs to be um, innovated on more. Okay, so the... The main dilemma, I love my memes. So do you pursue the option that's more safer for the user, but is not pursuing the integrity that we all are here for, um, the true nature of Ethereum and decentralization? Um, or do you pursue the option that is more risky for the user, but is in a whole 100% um, decentralized, which I don't think any protocol is, but has, um, uh, more de decentralized aspects than another protocol that you would face as a competitor. And that's kind of the main dilemma. No. So, I think that 
when you are pursuing these options, instead of pursuing immutability and governance upgradability, what you can start to think about is how do I set specific parameters to each different use case? So, one I wanted to really talk about was slashing. So, in a main feature of delegation that's live, on Eigenlayer in our M2 launch in a couple of weeks. A main thing that is going to be showcased in this is the ability to slash um, other node operators and stakers to slash node operators that are opting in to different AVSs that don't fit, fit the parameters um, that they like to identify with. And why this is important is because this is an act of governance upgradability and permissionless governance without taking the power away from the user. Because the user is still setting their slashing parameters um, prior to and um, making sure that they have a level of autonomy over who they're delegated to. And um, I think that having guardrails in this aspect not only protects um, their interests as a user, but also um, allows their protocol governance participation to be completely autonomous. Okay, so this is mainly just a screenshot I got from our restaking app, because our application is not live yet. But um, what this actually looks like in a main application interface is a um, user that could be a restaker wanting to opt out or undelegate to or how I would refer to slash a node operator that they're currently delegated to because they've opted in to an AVS, which is an actively validated service that um, they don't like or doesn't fit their risk parameters, they would actually have a notification in the UI that notifies them of um, this unde forced undelegation. And it would be similar to how you see app stores um, catering to different ad preferences or different recommendation preferences. So I think this is important because it takes all of the incredible infrastructure um, innovation that people are working on and then applies it to interfaces and tailors it to an experience that they would find preferable. Okay, am I, was I too speedy? If you, if you have, yeah, maybe that's good. Oh my God, no. Was, no, for context, I asked her um, to leave time for questions in the end. Um, does anyone have questions? Is there anything you want to like? Okay, good. <laughs> ah, no, there is questions, question. Great presentation, Tina. Um, I, I work with LivePeer, we're a proof of stake protocol, and we think a lot about KPIs for the network and the protocol. Do you have any advice um, on where we should be looking? What's the kind of the latest in standard setting and reporting on this stuff in the industry? Yeah, as a follow-up question, I would ask like, what sort of KPIs? Are you looking to increase network usage? Um, do you want the actual throughput speed of streaming to be faster, and that's a KPI for the developers? Um, are you looking to increase, um, yeah, that, that would be the first question I'd ask. The question, is, the question is more like who's doing a good job like laying out what decentralization KPIs are, and like it's like the dune of like reporting on decentralization of protocols. Yes. Um, so I don't think anyone is actually doing a good job. Mm. Um, but I think that um, a lot of the core researchers and leaders in the space, primarily the founders, do a good job of holding other founders accountable. Um, I think my favorite piece from uh, recently of this was um, within the recent Polygon launch. And a lot of the um, Polygon team members and other L2s uh, started to bring up conversations about what makes a L2 and rollup inherently decentralized. And from the sequencing layer to the validator uh, committer scheme, what is making um, it decentralized as a whole and what are the trade-offs that they're making? And um, I think the founders and researchers do probably the best job. But someone wants to capitalize on that and make that editorial, 
that's an idea. Go for it. <laughs> Great talk, great memes. Um, you are talking about governance and in the context of decentralization. Um, what is your opinion in, let's say, roll-ups using uh, proof of authority, um, like proof of governance instead of proof of stake for like decentralizing the sequencer, for example? Yeah, I think proof of authority, and actually when I was at Fuel, we were launching a proof of authority initially. And most of the roll-ups and networks that do this initially have plans to go to proof of staking systems in the future, but going to a proof of authority system with a single sequencer and a small a collection of validators is a lot easier to implement and execute um, just on an engineering side. I think none of them have the, the kind of the aim to launch a POA, and it's mo mainly just like how to get um, what they're trying to ship as fast as possible, but um, POSs are, are the end game, in my opinion. Some more questions? Okay, cool. Then thanks, Tina. Oh, wait. <laughs>